Hello everyone, welcome to Fresh Perspective and with me today, Marilette Kotze, but you also called Heyman. Yes, it's confusing, I know, it's the whole, um, the wonderful world of, yes, I would like to marry you and then lose half of my identity but replace it with with yours, but I'd like to keep it for work purposes, oh, yeah. but on invites I want you, it gets, con- it gets confusing. So All for right. work, good see you. Okay. So work is good here. So we we're going we are going to talk about your work today. So welcome. What do you do? What what's your work? Let's start there. Oh, you had to ask. I always warn warn people um, when when you're like at a bry and they say, "So what do you do?" I'm like, "Are you sure you want to go there?" <laughs> and they go, and then they get all intrigued, like, "Yes, what?" So here, uh, hi, I'm a sex therapist, um, and a imago a counselor. Or in Imago therapist, so I'm both, okay. and it's the best job in the world. <laughs> so, do you get people at parties asking you? You know, I'm I'm just asking for a friend when they ask you uh, about sexual things. Yes, often, all the time. Um, it got, it, it became such a problem at one stage. My um, long-suffering husband said, "Can we please not?" give therapy at Bryce. And I'm like, I don't give, give therapy. I give advice for their friends. And he's like, yeah, we both know that's not true. <laughs> like, yeah. So house rule. Yeah. <laughs> don't give therapy at Bryce. But w- w- what does a sex therapist do? How does it work? It's, it is the marriage counseling that most marriage counselors are too scared to do. It is literally, you speak about, um, your sexual matters, but in a very, very, very clear, very um, uh, explicit way. So I have many couples that show up and your most common things are like, okay, mismatched uh, sex drives. That is the most common thing I get at least one per week. It, it, it always happens. And then I go and I say, okay, fine, let's, let's talk um, on why this might be. Is this because of your health? Is this because of medication? Is this because you simply haven't been educated in the lists of love? Um, Why is this? And we go into a lot of of depth on things that nobody is actually comfortable speaking of, but I am. Uh Well, the list of love, what's that? Oh, it is technique. It's your practicality. Now, in Imago, as you know, um, we, um, we will focus a, a lot on the dialogue, okay? So, yadi yadi blah, blah, I hear you say, yadi yadi blah, blah, am I with you? Yes, please tell me, um, me, me more. But what we don't do a lot is your psychoed, is to literally have a go, this is the stuff that you need to know, and nobody will... will uh, will really uh, uh, teach you. And um, so I do both. I make sure that we get that real dialogue, that in, in depth, this is what I need. These are my wants. These are my wounds. And then I say, okay, fine. The clitoris is over here. And I draw a, a picture. <laughs> and this is how foreplay works. And I draw them a little diagram. And, and, and do we need to talk about, uh, about boundaries and um, not waking somebody up for sex because then we talk about that. So all the really practical stuff, all the nitty-gritty about making love that no one has ever taught us. Who's going to teach us? Yeah, that's so true. We get taught about, well, one of my common frustrations when, when doing therapy and also personally um, when I started my own journey, understanding what, you know, being in a marriage and in a relationship really means is we, we get taught that sex is this very bad, evil thing, especially mm-hmm. if you grew up Christian and Afrikaans Christian, even worse. It's a very Always. bad, evil thing, the biggest sin that you can... Yeah, why growing up, Sutu? <laughs> oh, is it even worse? Has nothing on not growing know. up, Sutu. Oh, mm. I didn't. Well, I want to know about that. But, yeah. but that's the thing for me. Then you get ma- married and then it's supposed to be the biggest gift God gave us. You know, just enjoy and go forth. 
and be merry. And what I find is uh, people, couples that grew up that way struggle more sexually than couples that actually, you know, experimented more even in high school and had different sexual partners. Do you find the same thing? Absolutely. Um, my, my, my theory is that, um, well, Imogus is the, uh, the same thing. We adapt. We, uh, we get certain messages and we uh, get them from people who matter. We get them from mom. We get them from dad. We get them from society. We get them from Omar. And then we sort of integrate them into our worldview. And so we, we live our formative years, which are actually our great sexual years. We live with this, uh, this, this belief, this, 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 this absolute trust that sex is a bad thing and beware and be careful and AIDS and ST, um, STIs and pregnancy and you're basically just going to die. Sex is the way to end the whole world. And now you fall <laughs> in love. And you <laughs> yeah, <trust> it's true. <laughs> it, it, it really is. Oh, my word, you've had sex. I've had mothers phoning me saying, my 17 year, year, year old is having sex. What do I do? I'm like, you, you tell them how to use a condom. <laughs> Yeah. They're not breaking the law. You, 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 you now sit down and you speak to them about how to do this safely. And then you knock before entering their room. And, and, and that has gotten me into a lot of hot water saying that. But that's fine. I like a good bath. And, 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 and then eventually we fall in, in love. And we are given these messages. Like men only want, want sex. Oh, sister, Really? Is that all that men want? Really? You don't think they want a beer too? Or, you know, <laughs> love? I don't know. Because they're human. And, and, and men are taught, women don't like, don't like sex. They don't enjoy it. Sorry, my cat has joined us. You know, they don't like it. And I'm like, and you're okay with this? You were taught this and you're okay with making love with somebody that, that doesn't like it? Mm -hmm. And then we get this idea in our head that it's our duty and so intimacy crumbles and fades and gets poisoned and we get married and we, we want to be so happy. And then the second that, you know, the wedding bells stop ringing and you're in the room with this person and you realize, oh my word, there's a mechanical process that needs to happen here. No one has spoken about how this is going to go. No one has made any plans experiences will vary, histories will vary, traumas will vary, and now you have to make this work. You, we, we have been set up for failure completely. So what are some of the, the education that you try and do? Um, mechanical stuff, I understand, you know, drawing pictures and what goes where and what does what and what feels good and what not. But what are some of the other stuff? Or you can even go into that more if you want. It'll be interesting to hear. Yeah. Well, for me, the most important thing, and it, it's such a cliche, it's such a cliche, is I want to teach people to talk about sex. I, 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 I want a couple to be able to, to say, this feels good and I want more. Mm -hmm. When you're a woman and you have been taught that you don't have a say. And I want a man to not think he has to guess because that, that's what, what men have been taught. The girl lies there and she waits for him to rock her world, <laughs> setting up for, for failure. So what I try, the most important thing for me is to get that dialogue. And the Imago dialogue is just, it's magic. It's so beautiful to talk about your... Your, uh, your, your uh, sexual self. First about where did but you get these it, messages? Yeah. I want to interrupt you because not everyone but, listening to this will know <coughs> what Imago is. You and I know. and I oh. but Can you just put into your words what Imago is? Because you're also obviously an Imago uh, counselor as well. Oh, if they don't know, guys, <laughs> go Google this. Go find this. This is, this is magic. Imago <laughs> is a way of... Uh, Not real magic, though. So don't look for like a magician. If you want real magic, go read Harry Potter. Okay, this is the scientific, <laughs> this is, this is scientific yeah. magic. All right. So Har Harville Hendricks, I think it was the mid-80s, he realized, but why, why is everybody just divorcing and why is marriage counseling not working? And he put a lot of time and... and um, 
and 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 um, thought and resources into figuring out what's going what's going on, why why, why our marriages is, are they failing. And he came up with a few good answers. The number one thing was I didn't feel understood. My uh, my husband, my wife didn't hear me, didn't see me, didn't understand me. And so he went and and just tried to figure out how to get people to really understand. And he developed this dialogue. Now, this dialogue is probably the most effective form of marriage counseling I've ever seen. Hmm. Um, and I've been doing this, this for about almost 10 years now, so I've checked. So how this works is you have one sender and one, other, one receiver. So it's not like I say, you say, I say. It's like one person sends and one person listens. And to make sure that they are listening, they mirror. So if I tell, um, um, tell you, I think the sky is blue, then my partner says back, I hear that you say that you believe that the sky is blue. Am I with you? And you say yes. Because normally with fights, with fights especially, but just normal or other talking, it will go like this. I believe that the sky is blue. Partner. I want to talk about a different uh, um, sky, and it's not my fault that the sky is is blue. I mean, sometimes the sky is pink, and you just go like, oh, you're not hearing me. And Havel saw this, and he went, listen here, I've got your fan. And he made this beautiful dialogue of, I speak, and, and you are, 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 are mirrored back. And he has a beautiful quote. He says that we are mirrored into, into, Oh, help me. You know this. Existence. Existence. See, yeah. You do know the part. Yeah. Um, and it's absolutely true. So now we, 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 we do this with a normal marriage. But we tend to not go into those sexual um, uh, um, um, past because Havel didn't really cater for it. He acknowledges it, but he didn't really cater for it. Then came in Dr. Uh, uh, Tammy Nielsen, and she catered for it. She gave us these uh, dialogues and she, she took that dialogue and she, she made it for sex to look at your, uh, uh, sexu- your, uh, um, your history, to look at your um, thoughts, your beliefs, your feelings and your needs. And um, that, that is beautiful. Um, she wrote Getting the Sex You Want, beautiful book. Go, go find it, stunning book. Um, and I use many of her dialogues and um, I, I use many that I sort of I've gathered throughout the years from friends, from other colleagues. Um, we do find some great dialogues. Um, I'm doing a, a, a workshop with um, uh, Michelle uh, Nordia. I think you do know her. Yes, yes. Great clinical uh, psychologist, probably one of the top three Imago therapists in the country, I would say. So I'm like, I'm doing a workshop with Michelle Nordia. <laughs> and she gave me these beautiful dialogues. So, um, and, and, to help couples to just talk about sex. You know, now you're talking about your feelings. So now let's talk about the hanky-panky. Let's talk about the, the fun stuff. We can now talk about our deepest pain, but we still can't talk about what do you want in bed tonight. So is this the webinar called uh, Vanilla is not the only flavor? No. Oh, so this is That's a different month. one. I have a very busy month. I have a very busy month. Um, lovely month. August are always my favorites because it's, um, it's women's month. And so I get to uh, cater to the ladies. Um, no, the webinar is on the, the 27th. Um, and that is vanilla is not the only flavor where we are going to look at um, consensual non, non-monogamy or alternative uh, sexual, um, sexual relationship uh, uh, Structures, so things like swinging, things like um, triads. Um, why this isn't cheating? Many people go, "Yeah, that's cheating." It's not. It's consensual, therefore it can't be. Mm-hmm. Um, things like uh, like uh, uh, polygamy or uh, polygyny or uh, um, things like um, like like those. Things that are practiced by five percent of the population of the USA at the moment, 5%. So actually very common stuff, but we don't know about it. We don't know how to handle it. And that is the topic of the webinar. 
Okay, so vanilla is not the only flavor, but we'll look into that. Um, uh, I think uh, 5% is probably a bit modest for South Africa. Might be even more than that in South Africa. See, now here it gets interesting because it probably is, but not for the reasons that you, um, that, that you might, might think because we, we do have a culture of a polygamy, mm -hmm. which is in our country, it tends to be one um, husband with many wives, yeah. um, which the marriage laws are busy changing because at, at this stage it's acknowledged as a traditional marriage but um, the legal stuff around that is very wishy-washy. So they are uh, trying to, to, to uh, formalize that a bit more, especially with things like inheritance. Um, it gets very, very, very complicated. Um, what we see a lot more in South Africa, especially in um, the Cape province and in, uh, in uh, Gauteng, is swinging. We're seeing a lot more other couples uh, swapping partners, we're seeing a lot more marriages that are just opening, yeah, um, opening up, so that we have um, normally, normally, a husband and a wife who are dating people. They are dating outside of their 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 marriage. They stay within this marriage, and it's loving and it's intimate and it's a complete marriage. But they date outside of it, and they have sex outside of this. Now, this comes with very interesting rules, um, which are specific to each couple, actually. There's no universal rule because this is still very new. Um, but the big thing is there's consent. It's discussed. And there is a certain pattern that this will follow. Um, so, yes, it is emerging a lot more, um, but not for the reasons that, you, that we might might think we 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 do see this in a Zulu culture, and 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 and. But this has become a young person thing. People in their thirties are now going, hmm, open marriages. Excellent idea. Let's try this. <laughs> yeah. Why do you think that need, um, you know, exists? How does it come forth to be a need to? Is it only sexual? Um, and maybe I might justify or motivate my question a bit more. I'm very curious what you think about this. But one of Esther Perel's who wrote Mating in Captivity, her, one of her kind of um, theories is like you create this very safe space at home where you communicate and you use Imago or whatever. So it's safe. It's a very safe, connected, emotional safe space. But mm -hmm. sex, um, it has this wild, adventurous side to it and risk yeah. and kind of not being yourself always or yeah. something like that. Is, is that kind of a big drive behind looking for other partners and, and opening up the conversation in the first place? Yes and no. Um, Tell me we, more. There is so much research now um, that's happening and, and so, so many theories. Um, the one theory is that humans were never made to be completely uh, monogamous um, because our lifespan was so much shorter. Um, I mean, we lived 200 years back. I mean, we lived to the age of 40. And, okay, we, we got married at 12, but we lived to about, <laughs> about 40. True. Um, so, so, so that was about, call it 15, 20 years of marriage enough time to raise a family to the point where they won't die. And then you died. So that was, was very simple. And um, 200 years back, 300 years back, 500 years back, we were all very much in a, a, a survival mode. And then came the wonderful world of, of economics. So we got married not for love. Most people didn't get, 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 get married for love. Your political other leaders, you know, the kings, the queens, those guys, they never got married for love. It was a very, very rare thing. Um, I can think of exactly one political match for, for love. Um, and even that was dodgy. So, 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 and you know that that was Anne Boleyn, so hmm, did not end, end well. So mostly we got married for gain. We either, either got married to have somebody to raise kids with that has to stick around to raise 
to raise kids legally. It was a legal um, thing. We, uh, we needed somebody to leave the farm to or to help us on that farm. We, uh, we, there was an, a need for a family, uh, for, um, family structure. And this was a legal need. It was a, a, a economic need. It was not actually a emotional need, even though it played into the fact that human beings are like wolves, like penguins, we are pair bonded. So we do tend to have one mate and stick with that mate mostly. But we brought the law into this big thing. And then we brought religion into this big thing. And marriage is where the, you know, the, the law and your faith meet. And there were all these things of you should be this, you should be this, you should be this. And then, of course, we ever get to our, our, our gender roles. And so marriage becomes really complicated and very ingrained in what it should be. But the theory is that what if we were just left without all this uh, political stuff? What if we were just left to be human? Would we be so monogamous? And the theory is that no, we will not. Because we are expecting of one partner to fulfill every single need. Our emotional needs, our physical needs, our sexual needs, our financial needs. Everything is now on one partner. Oh, that's a lot. Yeah. That's hectic. And this... This does lead to conflict and it does lead to pressure. But what if that burden was distributed? What if we had one, one, uh, one, uh, uh, <coughs> sorry, one partner for sex and one partner for having babies with and one partner to go skydiving with and one partner <laughs> to um, be kinky with? Yeah. You know, what if you have some weird fetish and the person that you truly love just isn't into this? Then you need some outside help. So there's a lot of theories about why, what, where, when, and what's happening. Biologically, we are pay bonded, but we are living so much longer um, that our needs have changed. And here we come to my friend Esther Peral, who makes an excellent and a uh, a um, wonderful point. I love that book because she said that it's a balance between being very close and very safe and very comfortable and very boring. Yep. And this is not where sex happens. This is not sexy. It is not sexy. And sorry, ladies, I know we don't want to hear this. And sorry, guys, I know we don't want to hear this. It is not sexy to walk around in your torn PJs on a Saturday with your hair not brushed, smelling like old goat. And um, swearing and farting in, in, um, in bed. This is not sexy, but it's very comfortable and it's very safe. What is sexy is being a little bit unavailable, being a little bit distant, you know, doing the makeup, doing the hair, having undefined corsetry, doing things there that your body does not look like that. But it's sexy. Mm -hmm. And a good marriage is a balance between these two states, the close, the safe, but to move and then be a little bit more risky and a little bit more, more, a bit more a bit sexy. And then to come back to come find your safe space and then to move. So she says that this is the best model. It's a very difficult model. It's a very difficult model. It's, yeah. What, what I've also found, maybe you can comment on this, Marilette, is, um, it seems like some couples are very good at sex <laughs> yes. and they have to be intentional about creating safety and connection. And then other couples, it's the other way around. They understand how to create the safety and connection, but they're not very good at the sex part. Yeah. So they have to be intentional about that part. And that's where people like you come in that focus specifically on, on, on sex therapy and guiding couples. Exactly. Um, and you say it so, so perfectly that, 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 that you are going to be more talented in certain other, other spaces. <laughs> I like the it fact is, that you're talented. It is. It is. It's definitely yeah, yeah, I that. Um, think about this. Think about this. Think about your first kiss, right? First kiss. Was it good? Uh, yes, it was good. It was exciting. Yeah. 
and I, I had nothing to compare it with. Yeah. See, most people's first kiss, not that good. But, you know, if you ask them how was it, they go like, well, it was exciting and it was very strange and it was wet. Most people say it was wet. People are very... Um, it was definitely wet, yes. I remember yeah, that too. People are struck by the wetness of a first, <laughs> first kiss. And I'm like, well, that's not good news at all. You know, that's just too much. Mm-hmm. But now think about your best kiss. And you'll see they're very different things. Mm-hmm. Your best kiss can be a first kiss, but it's actually the, um, the synergy between you and that person that just worked. It's that chemistry. It is the needs. It's the wants. It was the skills between two people that worked. Your best kiss was maybe not your best relationship. It maybe wasn't a re- relationship at all, mm-hmm. but there was a, a, a talent thing. And now think of your best friend. And you'll find that with your best friend, there is no sexual feelings at all. At all. And so many people say, I married my best friend. And I'm like, well, the sex must suck. (laughs) (laughs) Suck. Because you're too close. Mm. And now you need to work on that sex. And now you need to, to talk about fantasy. And now you need to actually unlearn safety to get excited. To get that, um, what's it, a, a dorsal vagal nerve yep. just firing, firing. Uh-huh. so that you can get excited, that you can get reactive and you can get turned on. Because if you're feeling too safe, you're not going to get turned on because mm-hmm. um, fear and um, being either turned on, there's a whole little band here in your brain and they sit right next to each other. That is why we watch horror movies and then we do the little stretch, you know, hey, baby, that stretch. Because when we're scared, we're a little turned on. And when we're a little turned on, we're a little scared. So the two sort of speak to, yeah, they, they, they sort of chat. So if there's too much safety, now this sounds very, very weird. We need to explore unsafe places to get you turned on. And those unsafe places are normally our childhood wounds where we were told, repress that, shut that down, do not talk here. And when we start to like sort of go, nip that, we find a place of reactivity, but also a place of sexual joy. Very strange place. Um, Doesn't and make that's sense though, like, like kind of rebelling against those boundaries that that was put there before, and now you like realize, oh, well, it's not that dangerous. Mm. We were taught that sex was dangerous, um, and we weren't taught what sex was before being taught that it is dangerous. So we sort of have this whole thing like holding hands is dangerous, mm. and um, to kiss is very dangerous, and. Um, And that's where the fun is. But we were taught don't do it. So the second we can tap into that, tap into the danger with somebody that we trust, which is safe, ironically. You need safety to get to that vulnerable place. That is where the magic happens. And and do you sometimes help couples to facilitate that conversation, okay? Because what you're saying makes a lot of sense to me. Um, Let's use the, the kissing that metaphor that you use now. So, you know, I've, I've had great girlfriends in the past, um, great people who I really connected with, and then we kissed and it was like, it was horrible. Maybe it was the same for them, but I was like, oh, no. I'm out. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I was like, ah, oh, no. You know, every time there was like a, a mood or a, you know, scenario after watching a movie or whatever where, there might be some smooching. I was dreading it. And I'm thinking of one yeah. specific person. Of course, I won't mention who that is. But um, you know, that wouldn't work. And, and um, you can get that sexually as well. Mm. And you don't know that beforehand. And now mm. you, you have sex with this person and it's terrible. And now you don't know how to talk about it. And maybe you because feel ashamed we- and you think something wrong oh. with you or something wrong with um, him or her, mm. and, and there's shame, no conversation. Guilt. The shame, yeah. Yeah, and also you love them. 
Mostly we, we, we will, and I see this in quite young marriages of very uh, conservative of, uh, 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 young, young, young people yep. who then go like, it's not working and we don't know why. And it literally um, will take them about three months of struggling to eventually go, somebody needs to help us now. Mm-hmm. And when you go and look at, at what's happening, you find this fear of hurting their partner's feelings mm. because they actually love them. And that's when we get into skills. I, there I go I might, into yeah, skills. I wanted to ask you about how much of, uh, you know, how much of it is skill, knowledge so and much. skill combined. So you have like, you yeah. can perform better. You can be a better sexual partner. Yeah. And that is it. Um, oh, I have this joke that I, I make and the sad thing is it's true. Where do men learn to make love? Pornography and yeah. their stupid friends. Never their smart <laughs> friends because their smart friends know to keep quiet. Okay? Their smart friends don't, don't, don't go, go as saying, well, my, my uh, the girlfriend told me this because the girlfriend will kill them. Mm. So that is where most men learn, learn, uh, um, learn how to make love. Where do most women learn to make love? They don't. Uh, uh, nowhere, yeah. I wanted to say nowhere. They don't, yeah. Nowhere. Maybe you can read Fifty Shades, but that's not going to teach you anything. Um, sorry, that's not oh. a very good guide. We don't have knowledge of how to make love. And pornography is literally made to look pretty. It's not actually made to work. Um, it's not effective. If, 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 if you look at porn with a very uh, critical eye, you sort of look like, eh, dude, you're too high. Oh, it's too low. That's too hard. Okay, that's just the wrong angle. And yeah, I can't watch porn at all. I'm very critical. I, 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 I'm, I'm just because the on, specifically on the male's performance. And the females. It's like ah. you're, you're faking it and you're faking it badly. Also, you're not helping him. Ah, okay. okay. Because how much this poor guy know what you want as women? Must he Google you? What does <laughs> Anamart on sale want in bed tonight is is that ever gonna happen (laughs) no so okay so talk about the skill and i wanted to ask you about pornography as well but talk about the skill how do you learn these skills where do you learn these skills both as a man and as a uh, as a woman it's so difficult because you always end up with porn um i remember i was about about 19 i think and i was a and I knew I wanted to be a, 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 a sex therapist and my uh, grandmother nearly had heart failure. Sorry, Oma. <laughs> and um, I wanted to know more. Um, I met my husband round about at this time. I'm one of those lucky people. I married my first boyfriend. I did. Okay. <laughs> Worked out well. <laughs> but, um, and I started to just talk to people who knew more than... Um, than me with love, my slutty friends. And, oh, I loved them. It was so much, because it it was so safe to say, okay, fine, but what actually works for you? Mm -hmm. I want to know what works for you. Not because I'm going to go be, you know, I'll be be, uh, um, playing with you later. This is you you and me as a friend saying what works for you. Mm -hmm. And I spoke to a lot of my male uh, guys, you know, um, guy friends and, just to find out little things like um, a hand job, okay? Have you ever had a talk with somebody about how does, what works for you? What do you find good? What do you find bad? What are little tricks that you wish that your partner would know? Nobody has these talks because they're too embarrassed. I was not. I was not. <laughs> um, and I had this talk with a lot of men. And then I... Um, they asked me, so what do girls actually want? And I was like, okay, well, I, I, I can tell you what I want. I don't actually know, know what girls want. And I went to go and talk to girls. Turned out they don't know what they want either. Um, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Because girls were taught, don't touch them. Yeah. We do not touch them. That's Australia. It's down under. <laughs> you know, we don't go there. <laughs> and then I started to read up a lot more. And then I, uh, I, I was lucky I could uh, study. And I found all these great, great books, great resources. I have a lot of books. And I realized that these are not available. You, you, it's so hard to just Google how do you do this without ending up on porn. 
Um, there's a few interesting sites um, that are useful. I don't know if they even still exist. But then you go and read up on these skills. And now at this stage, I was just starting to date my brand new boyfriend. We know nothing about nothing. We are very young and very stupid. So we did the smartest thing ever. And I didn't know it was very clever then, but it was. And we started to talk about everything. We started to talk about what do you think you would, would like? Because Afrikaans girl, Afrikaans boy, we're not going to do anything mm -hmm. because we have strict mothers. Um, <laughs> and we just spoke about what do you think you would like and what are your thoughts about this? And I read this, what do you think? And then when we started to do these things and we saw what this works and this doesn't, it was so easy it was so, so, so easy because the door was there to say, that's not working. That's not working. Try that thing. Oh, that's working. Keep going. Yeah. And to be able to talk in a very non-critical way, do not ever criticize your partner for their sexual prowess. Don't do that. You will destroy their soul. Do not do that. You always tell them what's working. Never tell them, if you need to say what's not working, be very kind. Is that, is that kind of money led why people, um, going back to people looking for other partners outside of their marriage, um, they feel they can say these things to someone else and ask for these things and actually, um, you know, reveal their deepest desires or their fantasies to someone else that's not like the, the father or the mother of the children? I think with some people it's true, but I think it's a lot more simple. Um, when you're in love, those first about two months to two years, when you're this in love, mm -hmm. your body is flooded with hormones. And it's flooded with all the nice hormones, with dopamine, vasopressin, oxytocin, serotonin, dopamine, all these really, really nice hormones. So sex is really easy. It comes so naturally. And so if you go and look for somebody else to do this with, you have all those hormones and they are linked to that person. So then it's, 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 it's all very, very simple. So I, I think it's an exit, again, imago, I have a term, but I do think that sometimes it's just like, oh, let's just go back to the romantic stage. It was so easy. Mm -hmm. The romantic stage will fade again and you'll be exactly where you, um, um, you are. So it's much better to work on what you've got than try and go find something new. Just trust me. Okay. Okay, so, so what I hear you saying is like, uh, sure, there's couples that explore it that way and that's a possibility and it's consensual and, and so forth. But what you'd recommend, um, carefully, I'm, I'm hearing, you can help me with that, but is rather figure out how to create this dangerous but safe space with your partner sexually. Exactly that. Uh -huh. Exactly that. It's always better to, how do I say this? Um, it's always better to build what you have than to get something new that you don't know. Mm -hmm. So if I have a, a, a certain car and I know that this car runs like this and be careful, the, the gears stick here, then I can run that car perfectly. But if I go buy a new car, then I don't know how the, how the clutch works and then I'll have to relearn the whole damn car. So it is much better to build where you are and it's easier and it's safer and it's more fun. It is more fun because um, you don't really know your partner. Yes. Well, that's what my wife and I have discovered and um, we're still on that journey for sure. But mm -hmm. you, you mentioning hand jobs before for me to at one stage in our marriage, be able to tell my wife, you know what? Actually that hurts. Let me, let me show yeah. you. <laughs> how to do that so i enjoyed and what a beautiful it. moment and she and she was like oh okay now she'll ask me is, is this right is it like that or whatever we are doing we communicate much better uh we obviously there's still room for improvement and um, oh. because we're still shedding some of that that guilt and that shame and that don't yeah. you know it's bad and whatever yeah. um, but it makes okay. sense to me. It makes sense to me on a personal and professional level that you rather learn to communicate with this person that you already love, that you have the safety with. And it also mm -hmm. makes sense to me what you're saying about the romantic love phase, that 
Yes, you can find a sexual partner outside of your marriage and you, it'll feel like it just works. But once that, the drugs wear off, it'll be the same thing and you'll be looking yeah. for someone else again. Yeah. And you can't keep, keep doing that. Um, you'll wear thin. Um, you'll, you'll, you'll get exhausted um, just because your body was never made to have all those hormones all the time. It's just too much. So you can get sort of burnt out on over dating. It's just too much. I've spoken um, to a few young people on, on, on uh, dating apps and so forth that feel like that. They, they're tired of the one-night stand type yeah. of approach. They get worn out exactly. That's exactly the word yeah. they use. Like, um, I'm tired of it. That. It gets old because nobody sees you. Nobody knows you. Nobody understands you. Um, and, 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 and you're missing out on the stuff that makes sex worthwhile. What really makes sex so, so beautiful is that it is something that you share that is a complete secret. It is this precious, precious, precious thing that nobody ever sees. Um, what your face looks like in that moment of ecstasy. Mm -hmm. Nobody will ever see that except your closest partner, yeah. your husband, your wife. Nobody will see that. I mean, so many women, I love this. So only two people will see, will see me naked, my husband and my doctor, but only one will see you orgasm. And that's hopefully not your doctor. <laughs> because it'll make them very uncomfortable. <laughs> okay. So, so uh, I'd like <coughs> you to share some of the books uh, that you think can help people learn these skills. Whew, guys, there are so many and some are really funny. Um, for one, not the Kama Sutra. Not the Kama Sutra. Yeah, it's, not, um, it's I, not just about positions, right? It's not. It's not. The first half is actually really good. But don't go read the Kama Sutra for positions because that's silly. The Kama Sutra was uh, written by a guy called Patitiana, um, sometime BC. I can't remember the exact date. And it was a guide for young men to make love to their young wives and to make sure that uh, um, um, if they were in a higher of a case, the wife could take a lover if the husband wasn't good. So it was sort of a guide to help men to figure out what kind of wife they, um, they have and to make her happy, and, um, which is a very sweet way of thinking. But the guy that wrote it um, sort of bought into this thing of, okay, there's a big vagina and there's a little vagina. And there's a big penis and a little penis. And now we have to match these up. And modern research shows that that is a fallacy. <laughs> Excuse the pun. Um, but it is, it, 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 it's, it's absolutely wrong. Um, yes, you do get larger penises and smaller penises, but in such a small degree, I mean, you're looking at, in length, in about a range of one and a half to two centimeters max of variation in girth, about, you know, five millimeters um, in either girth. And it doesn't matter because a, a vagina can handle the size of a lemon and um, on any other given day. And most penises cannot do that. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter. Also, it's a muscle, so it can literally do this. Okay, so your, the size of your penis doesn't matter at all. Um, sorry, the clitoris is also on the outside, and that is the only bit that can feel. The whole, uh, the whole um, uh, the canal um, can um, not feel anything unless the uh, clitoris is, um, has, you know, excitement, mm -hmm. has blood supply. Yeah. If it doesn't, then the lady just feels pressure. And then she goes like, oh, okay, fine. fine. <laughs> <laughs> but what so about the, is there uh, the difference between the clitoris and the G-spot? Because I've, I've, um, Tim <laughs> Ferriss specifically talks about that in one of his books. Yeah. Um, talk about that for a while, please. The jury is still out on, okay. on that one. There is a huge fight, huge debate. The leading theory is that the, uh, the G-spot is a part of 
the, uh, the clitoris, which is accessible because of a, a, a mutation that there's a thinning of the other vaginal wall. And so you can sort of get the backside of the, the clitoris. The clitoris is not just a little bit that you see. Oh. Okay. Most people say, oh, it's so small. It's not so small. It's 12 centimeters. It's six on each side and with too long crura. And um, if that's not filled with blood, the vagina doesn't feel anything. It just feels pressure. So the bit that feels good is the clitoris full stop, and it's on the outside. The bit that you can handle is on the outside. Um, and if you don't get, get it sort of woken up before you start making love, then your lady's going to be bored. She's literally, she's just going to be bored. Um, sometimes it can be painful, but to have that checked out, sex should never hurt, ever. It should not be painful for men or, or ladies. It shouldn't be. But she can be very bored. And then immediately it's like, okay, now we need to work, work on foreplay. So the Kama Sutra does not, not focus on this. They think the position matters. It absolutely does not. Um, if you want a deeper penetration, pull your legs up. If you want a more shallow one, put one leg down. There we go. Whole Kama Sutra summed up in two sentences. Have fun with that. <laughs> um, so um, what's fun about the Kama Sutra is they do speak about biting and stroking and massaging and setting up the room. But I feel that's a, a conversation. That is not something you, you must guess at too much. Don't randomly go bite somebody. Ask them if they like biting. <laughs> um, so the Kama Sutra is one that I'll say, Read it, but don't take it too seriously. Okay. It's a very boring book. If you read the, the text, it's very boring. Um, Tracy, uh, Tracy Cox has written a few fun books, and she's a sex <laughs> Tracy expert. Tracy Cox, that's on Tracy Cox, or, or she wrote Super Sex and Super Flirt, and it's these very pop culture books. They are very, very, very pop, pop culture, but with really good... Um, uh, good uh, the details in very well uh, well uh, uh, well written well uh, researched very practical and very funny um and a lot less uh, the clinical if you're going to go for your clinical stuff i read medical books sorry i read medical books so i um literally read books on uh, gynecology and urology and didn't understand most of it but um yeah always so I, I do say go for the fun, fun stuff. There is one book. Oh, what's the thing? Um, the Art of Loving Sex. I do not know the author, but right. that might be the, look that yeah, the, yeah, it might be the single best reference book for making love that I've ever read because it really goes through everything really beautifully. Um, and I cannot remember the author because I'm useless. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> the... Joy of Sex, which it was written in, I think, the 1950s or 60s. Always fun. Always um, quite accurate, um, but very, very, very old. But um, they, there hasn't been a need to, re to rewrite it. Yeah. So very, very good book. Okay. The Act of Marriage. Did you read that? I have not, but I would like to. Uh, you, you can, but I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's a great book. <laughs> okay. um, very based on Christian doctrine and so mm. forth. Another book that's based on um, Christian doctrine in a certain sense, um, but not like the act of marriage, is Sheet Music. Oh, that sounds pretty. Sheet Beautiful Music, time. yeah. It's, it's a small booklet and it's, uh, I love reading it. Um, it's very explicit and, in a, you know, in a tasteful way, just explaining uh, – exactly what to do and yeah. also uh, encouraging conversation. I remember I was um, uh, having lunch at a restaurant. I was reading this book and I was actually reading a bit about masturbation. Mm. Um, and I, after a while I saw the waiter was standing there and frowning, looking at the book. <laughs> <I was laughs> it's like, do you want to read? It's yeah. great. <laughs> I showed him the title, so I'm, I'm not sure if he got the book. Yeah. Well, maybe I that's so. one that you can read, and then when we talk again in the future, you can give us your opinion. Uh, seeing as oh, you, uh, 
you much um, more informed and have read much more on the topic than I have, obviously. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> okay, but uh, could we speak about pornography a bit? Um, when is yeah. it good? When is it bad? Is it ever good? Is it only bad? <laughs> well, again, I've got strange views on this. I see, uh, I see pornography as straw rum. Okay, not even as vodka or brandy. I see it as straw rum or mampur. Okay, so everybody's tried it. Not everybody likes it. And it should not be a habit. Nobody likes it, I think. <laughs> so I've, I've met people that go, hey, do you want straw rum? It's like, no, I do not want to get drunk in four seconds. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Um, pornography, clinically, clinically speaking, is very bad for you. It is um, actually bad for your mental health, and it's very, very, very bad for your uh, sexual health. Um, for an interesting reason, it robs you of the ability to fantasize. It makes the, um, the part of your, your brain used for, for a, a fantasy, it makes lazy, it makes inactive, which means that when you are with your partner, the part that needs to light up and get you turned on doesn't because it's waiting for a visual cue. It's waiting for porn. And so what we see is um, in men what we call porn, porn induced uh, uh, um, dysfunction, erectile dis, um, dysfunction, that we have these young men, literally men of like 25, very, very, very young, who should be sort of at the peak of their uh, performance with ED, and they, they just can't uh, 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 perform with their partners who are, you know, 25, 24-year-old young women, also at the peak of their, uh, their beauty, of their femininity, and they can't perform because this part of your brain has been switched off. So clinically, for men, I think if, if you're going to use porn, anything more than once in two weeks is too much. Sorry, it's too much because it will rob you of that part. Um, porn for couples together, m many couples like this. By all means, you do you. Um, however, do not be uh, coerced into uh, something that doesn't actually turn you on. Um, you know, do something that you like. Don't do something that you don't like for your partner. There must be that boundary, I feel. Mm -hmm. But some, but some people love it. Um, porn addiction is a real thing, and it's very difficult to treat. Very difficult and time-consuming. Mm -hmm. I had a, 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 a client seeing me for pornography addiction. I think three and a half years before, and 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 he still has episodes. He still stumbles, and it just wreaks havoc on his whole life. Mm -hmm. Um, so it is like very strong liquor. It is like straw rum. It is like mampur. It is, it is, it, it, it is potentially dangerous, but with very little use, it can be fun, but I am not a fan of pornography. I do not recommend it ever. Um, I myself do not watch it for one. I'm too critical, but two, it's unhealthy. Um, if my husband does, I don't know. I feel that 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 is private, um, but I am not a fan. So sometimes, you know, that's that's the issue for a relationship. Uh, a wife might discover her husband watching porn uh, or discover his secret file on Slash. his yeah. whatever. Um, so how do you deal with that when one person watches porn and feels it's okay, and another person the other person doesn't? Okay, cliche. It's a discussion. You need to talk about those boundaries. However, here, here's, here's the, the raw facts. Everybody will fantasize. Everybody, we are, are talking about 98%, the stats say, of people will, will uh, have a, a, a fantasy about somebody who is not their partner. This is normal. Hmm. Fantasies are normal. You can be making love to your partner who you love dearly and be thinking about somebody else. You could be thinking about, I don't know, who's sexy, Heath Ledger. Uh, okay, 
yeah. Angelina Jolie, right? Idris Elba, there you go. Okay, and you can have this picture in your head of something of something else. And you know what? Go for it. Get those 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 that that gray matter working for you. By all means, fantasize. Pornography is another fantasy. It is not reality. Now, it is a lazy fantasy, which is the problem. That is the actual problem that it makes you lazy. The actual imagery is not the problem. If that was just in your partner's head, that would not be a, a, big, a big problem at all because it's not real. So most wives go like, oh, but you want somebody else. You want a, 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 a porn star. Okay, but can he have one? <laughs> And if he had the porn star, would he stop watching porn? Probably not. Because it's not about you as a person. It's about the image. And the image is fake. It's not real. That woman doesn't exist. Not even the uh, girl that is playing that, um, that role. That's not who she is. That's not what she wants or what she likes. She's not his girlfriend. Or, it's an image. That's all it is. And to... Accept that fact. Ladies, your husband will masturbate. Leave him. Okay? If the shower takes a little bit longer, leave him in the shower. Okay? Give him that spare time. It is okay. Gentlemen, encourage your wives to masturbate. It is good for them. Mm -hmm. And it's not about you. It's about their health. Your partner chooses you every single day. They have the right to at any moment to not choose you. They have the right to at any moment to walk away. They don't do it. Why not? Because you are worth more than pornography. You are worth more than an, a clip on Pornhub. And that is the bit that I want the ladies to really understand about porn and gentlemen to understand about sex toys. You cannot replace your partner with a sex toy or porn. If we... we and if you can, you should. If that is all your partner is, then you should. <laughs> then you should. I like the way you, you put it now, Marilet. So on the one hand, you, you're saying, and help me if I miss something, is on the one hand, you're saying pornography is dangerous um, and unhealthy, uh, which I agree with, um, and can be an uh, addict. Um, and, and some people will get addicted you know, quite quickly and easily yeah. and it'll ruin their sex life, their sex drive later on as well as you explained. Um, but you're also saying if a wife discovers the pornography, it's kind of, it's not the end of the world, have the discussion and if the husband needs help with, you know, the addiction and that's like get that help. Um, but that's not the end of the world. Yeah, not at it all. It does not mean not, yeah. you are not good enough. And and the, mm. on the other side, you're saying uh, sex toys women mostly use. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to replace the husband. So if you discover that something that you might not know about or did not know about, don't feel like you are being replaced. Have the discussion and maybe yeah. incorporate those toys during lovemaking. Yeah, the big question is what does she get from those from those other toys that she's not getting either from you? Probably stamina. And, and probably stamina, but also a lack of effort. Mm. And that's the same for with pornography, right? Toys and what women actually have are two different things. Most sex toys are this size. It's that 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 big. It is a bullet. It's the most popular uh, of a toy, and it works entirely on the outside. It is for the clitoris only. And what that is, is a way for a lady to get an orgasm within about, let's say, seven minutes. Let's be fair here and say about seven minutes, okay? It's like this. Um, and then to sleep. Just, like, lie down and sleep. It is not for intimacy it is not for love it is it is literally i want to sleep where's my toy mm. and it's a, a a lot faster and you get a lot more from your from your partner um so stamina yes okay fine stamina but if you struggle with stamina then we can work on that that's fine 
Um, but what you have is an orgasm. It is a canned orgasm. It's just physiological. It's in your body. It is a means to an end. Because women are lazy too. I mean, using your hands, yeah, it, it's, it's effort, man. <laughs> <laughs> and, and where do you send clients that want to buy these things, especially the traditional, very uh, Christian Afrikaans clients? Where do you send them to buy these things? Where do they get this? I have my favorite shop. I do uh -huh. a cosette and they have a, um, a, a, a website. It is uh, cosettes.co.za. And it's very discreet and it's very, 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 you know, classy. It's very classy. That's the number one thing. It's classy. Um, and um, if they're in Bloemfontein or in Ava Cape Town, there is a shop in Durbanville in Ava Cape Town and in West Dean in Bloemfontein. And um, these are beautiful shops, um, elegant, um, sophisticated. You walk in, you get champagne. It's beautiful. <laughs> Well, I'll go just for that. I've been to yeah. a sex shop with my wife um, more than once, but one specific one was was uh, traumatizing to me because it was very tacky. I felt like I was in a scene in like pop fiction or something. I was like, yeah. I'm going to get hurt here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I am not a fan. That's the problem, right? The, the sleazy, yeah. um, dark. Sleazy, dingy, mm. blocked out windows, triple X. Yeah. That's a, a part of the porn culture. Yeah. And it's part of what, what defeats women. Sex toys are for the women. They, 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 and the guys have very few sex toys aimed at guys. I mean, you have the flashlight and its friends and probably some anal beads. I mean, that's, 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 that's basically it for guys. Women have like this incredible range of thousands of different toys um, that all do very different things and they're really beautiful and women will not go into an adult world or a hustler because it's creepy mm -hmm. and it's dirty and you don't and you feel as if like this is the dirty side of sex and it makes you feel guilty and gross mm -hmm. that is why you go to a up a upmarket a, a shop. Uh, there's one in Johannesburg as well, Lola Montes. Right. That's beautiful. And, and online, that. is there somewhere you send people online? Matilda's is very nice. Okay. Um, and actually, Dr. Eve has an online shop. I don't know what her, I think it's just dreve.com. Um, but yeah. Okay. Um, it's actually quite simple to have a Google. Um, you can also just Google the make. So, um, uh, Lilu is one make and Jeju is one make and, and, and those are beautiful beautiful toys really they are upmarket they look like they escaped from lava lamps just a, a little bit oh, but wow. they're very beautiful and that's the, 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 the thing that, that sleazy dingy um, that's, that's not sex that's not sexy that's pornography which means that it's not functional and you want something that is going to make you feel beautiful, going to make you feel sexy, going to make you feel intimate. And for that, I'm hoping that our shopping a culture can change a little bit, that sex shops are not going to be vilified. So, Cosettes. Okay, thank you. Um, my last question, I see we, we're running out of time. My last question, and maybe we'll have a part two, because I have much more questions that we <laughs> won't be able to get to today. But um, my last question is, what do you feel is your superpower? Mine? Mm -hmm. I'm not shy. You can't scare me. Mm. And um, which is saying something with most other therapists. Um, most other therapists don't want to talk about sex. They get very, very, very scared. Like, I'm going to stop talking about that. I'm like, yeah, come, penis, come. What is that? <laughs> Tell me about that. <laughs> Let's talk more. Yeah. Well, it's definitely been great talking to you, Marile. Thank you so much. And um, I even enjoyed the, you know, when I contacted you about this, the way you were joking uh, <laughs> leading up to this conversation. I knew we would have a great time chatting. And you make it easy to talk about these things and um, on a, even on a, a space, in a space like this. But um, 
I'm guessing you do the same for your clients. So I wish you all the oh, best. Definitely. I try. I try. I want my other clients to, to, to talk freely because most of us haven't had the space to do that. Yeah, that's the big issue, right? And you, you help create that space. All right. Now, where can people reach you? And uh, I'll put the links to your webinar in there. And uh, where can they contact you if they need to talk to you? See, here, here, here I'm in trouble. I do not have a website. I'm so sorry. Um, you can find me on uh, uh, Facebook at Marilet, a uh, coach a therapist on uh, on uh, Facebook. I'm quite easy to uh, Google, but my um, uh, phone number is 082-705-3022. Email is kotsamarilet at gmail.com and just WhatsApp me and we can talk. All right. Perfect. We can talk about a, a, a session. No, no free therapy. Only okay. advice. Advice at Bryce. So if you want free yes. advice from Marilette, you have to and be invited to, to a, a Bryce. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's the deal. <laughs> yes. And I hope to see many people at the webinar on the 27th and our couples our workshop on the 12th of September. So 12th of September, it's a couples workshop with Michelle and the 27th yep. of August, it's vanilla is not the only flavor. All right. That's Please it. send me those links, Marilette, and I'll make sure it's included here. I'll definitely do that. Thank you so much. All right. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. You. Bye.